This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. CBD is a game changer sweeping the nation. This hemp extract is the natural way to elevate your mood, eliminate aches and pains, reduce anxiety, and keep you sleeping all night long. It can even cut your workout recovery time in half. Get in the game today with 20% off all orders of CBD and lavender products from Lavender Lane, a lavender farm located right here in Milan, Michigan. Just go to LavenderLaneMI.com today and enter coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order. Guys, look, these amazing products are infused with calming lavender to maximize their effectiveness, meaning your CBD items only take minutes to take effect, which is way quicker than those pills you were about to swallow. On top of it, they are perfect for men and women. Lavender Lane has lab-tested CBD creams, tinctures, and roll-ons that are perfect for any situation, even if you're on the go. Put your health back in your hands by heading over to LavenderLaneMI.com and entering coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order of CBD and lavender products. What do you have to lose? Your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. So if you need lavender gifts for your loved ones or just looking for the natural way to ease your discomfort with CBD, go to LavenderLaneMI.com and use coupon code DETROIT to unlock these miraculous benefits of CBD and lavender. That's L-A-V-E-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-E-M-I dot com. And remember, use coupon code D-E-T-R-O-I-T for 20% off your CBD and lavender products from Michigan's own Lavender Lane. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. Welcome in, everybody, to the latest edition of the Motor City Sports Rant. This is John Macaroon. Joining me via telephone, Jason Jarvey, about to kick off a great Tuesday. What's up, my friend? Well, you know, just another week and uh, getting closer to Christmas. I know, man. Uh, actually, it's an interesting time because as another year of Detroit sports wraps up, everybody's kind of recapping what they're seeing. The wings are struggling. Jeff Blash will probably soon to be on his way out. The Pistons have been up and down. Uh, the Lions and the Tigers are probably uh, no closer to winning than any other organization in town. So it's an interesting time. And then uh, on the heels of a, a destruction at the hands of Ohio State, Michigan lost. And then what happened to Michigan State in terms of their six loss season, their six and six. We're going to talk about that later on in the podcast. What does it mean potentially if the Quick Lane Bowl extends an invite to Michigan State. What does that really mean for the program and where they're at? But obviously, we got to talk a little bit about the Detroit Lions and where they're at. Obviously, since we last spoke, things have continued to take a nosedive. 0-4 in the last quarter. Matt Patricia, when he's coming to the podium, looks defeated. He looks a little bit down. I mean, I don't blame him because of the fact that you're putting in all these hours of work and the biggest area of struggle that you have is the defense. Everybody's talking about firing Pasqualoni. He's, you know, uh, standing there taking a lot of the heat. And eventually speaking, it's a, you know, results-based business that everybody talks about. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to people, and they indicate to me that Matt Patricia is going to be back because when you look at all the facts and the variables surrounding it, his contract goes in line with Bob Quinn's. I don't think they're going to fire Bob Quinn. So there's built-in excuses, but at the end of the day, the biggest question, the biggest variable has got to be, does anybody really believe in this defense, and how can a defensive guru work with his mentor and put out a defense like that, even though there are injuries, some of the talent that has replaced you know, some of those players, like when, when Rashawn Melvin goes out, uh, you know, you got a player that's a little bit better and performing better that comes in. So you can't really use excuses too much on the defense. Yeah, there's been players in and out, but, you know, at the end of the day, 
you got to build a scheme where if players do indeed go out with injury, they the people that come in have to be able to execute, right? Absolutely, and it's just it, that's the that's my main thing is what I see is that I see this defense come out week after week, and I just I don't see them adapting. And this isn't something new. This isn't just the Matt Patricia era. This is this is like my life as a Lions fan. This is what I've seen from the defense is that they come out. If they get burned, they don't come out in the second half and they don't adapt. And there is some hope that Matt Patricia coming from New England and being able to come out and game plan for teams and be able to be, like you said, a defensive guru. And watching the Sunday night football game with the Patriots, it's not a great example because the Patriots got beat by the Texans, but they had the clip of Bill Belichick and his you know, outlook and how he approaches games. And it was the Sun Tzu, the the art of war, is that, you know, you you attack your opponent's weakness. And I just, I don't see them doing that. I don't see them adapting. You know, looking around the league this year, you know, Baltimore has been able to put it together. And they they did look shaky at the beginning of the season. You know, they, they got two quick losses. And their defense looked like it was in shambles. But their defensive coordinator realized what was going on and is adapted. And now, I mean, the big thing is, is that they, they started blitzing. And, you know, I'm not saying that all the Lions have to do is blitz and they're going to be a better team. But they got to do something to to switch it up because it just seems like we're trotting out the same thing week after week. And it's not working. Yeah, and I think when people observe Mitchell Trubisky and Dwayne Haskins come in and perform that well, it's because of the fact they have all day to throw. And any quarterback, you and I, if you give us six seconds, could find somebody, you know, as a check down to get five or six yards. And that's the problem is that when Patricia is asked about it, he says, look, they're NFL talent. It can happen. He cited, you know, one of the upset victories that took place. But at the end of the day, when it's a consistent pattern, he knows. Look, uh, I posted it on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast. He is, when he's verbalizing things to the media guys, he's reading from a script from his brain. Because literally, uh, when the Patriots lost, <laughs> what did uh, <laughs> what did the guru Bill Belichick say? I give my team credit. We played hard. They out-executed us and uh, things like that. Which is literally, uh, Matt Patricia is not even hiding it. He's just copying word for word what Bill Belichick would say. And it's it's a fascinating look at how things are but he knows that uh, at this point in time that you know he's not going to dog Bob Quinn but at the same time Matt Patricia does have some reason to kind of expect maybe a little bit more talent meaning that in the first round you could have had you know Ed Oliver you could have had uh, another player like Brian Burns you could have had another defender they took a tight end Uh, the organization invested money in snacks and Mike Daniels and whatever input Patricia had, he'll, you know, obviously take culpability. But at the end of the day, Bob Quinn's got to give him a little bit more talent on defense. You shipped off Quandre Diggs. And so I'm fascinated because really at the end of the day, if you just be educated, the, and that's what I wrote in my SI.com article, is the Lions are not conducting themselves like a team that's in a win-now mode. Okay, if you look critically at it, if you trade away Quandre Diggs, okay, Bob Quinn has to discuss this with somebody. This would indicate, okay, we're going to take a hit on our defense. We're going to potentially, you know, maybe this is their way of subliminally tanking without tanking. Okay, now look, the defense looks bad and things like that. But remember, the season started 2-0-1. They did make plays to start the year. But then maybe along the way they recognize, oh, man, Stafford's back is going to get worse. It's a time bomb, and we know it's coming. And so they recognize, okay, Stafford's out. We can trade away Diggs for another pick. We can invest. And that's what my first sentence was in the article was, it doesn't appear that they're coaching to win every single game like it's their job. They're coaching like, okay, we got to kind of build our system. We're going to take our lumps. We're going to go out there, maybe earn a top five draft pick, and then this draft load up on five guys and then pick up two guys, hopefully that will contribute next year and make a run at 10 wins next year. That's, how, that's what it looks like to me. It looks like one big 
uh, plan to load up for next year and really make a go at it. It doesn't look like, and it doesn't appear to me, I, I'm openly saying it, and I wrote about it, I think Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn get their year back, they get year three, they come back with Matthew Stafford, and I would say I'm a little bit more hopeful in terms of the fact that if you draft higher, you can get a little bit more talent, and if you do dedicate it, but definitely we're getting besieged by those people that say to me, John, uh, you're talking best case scenario here. They may take a wide receiver. They may take a running back in the first round. There's no guarantee that logic will apply to the Detroit Lions. But doesn't it appear to you that they're tanking without saying they're tanking? Yeah, but it doesn't. It definitely doesn't look like they're trying to win. I mean, exactly. It doesn't to, look like try, try to try to get out David Blau not going out and trying to. Get the, there's one quarterback out there who might actually be better than uh, half of the starting quarterbacks in this league in Colin Kaepernick. He didn't go out, and I don't, I don't mean to just harp on Colin Kaepernick, but it is someone out there who would immediately upgrade the quarterback position. And, you know, Blau, Driscoll, they were serviceable, but they, they weren't going to win you football games. And But to also say that they're doing this in – in the foresight of, hey, we're going to load up, we're going to get a bunch of defensive guys next year, and we're going to make a run next year, that's saying that the Lions are actually thinking about this and that they have this plan, and you're giving them way too much credit because they just have this mentality that, oh, we're the smartest guys in the room. And you know what? Maybe you're right, and that's what they're thinking. Oh, we're going to load up on picks. We're going to take TJ Hawkinson with the first round because – He's a he's a skiing guy. He fits our, our team. We know the best player to take. It's not going to be any of these other guys. We know exactly who it is. And that's the issue is that they're not the smartest guy in the, in the room. And nobody's telling them that. <laughs> I think the record indicates that. I think the heat that they're taking when uh, also in our opinion pieces, we're dropping bombs on them saying, look, you know, you lose to Washington. You can be bad, but you can't lose to Washington. Look, you can lose the rest of your games. You just can't lose to Washington. <laughs> it's, it's a funny league, and uh, it's funny to hear because uh, seeing it firsthand, uh, I was at Allen Park on Monday, and, you know, you know, uh, Paul Pasqualoni was addressing the media and started off uh, interestingly talking about the scheme and his, some of his thoughts. And then near the end, then the, the heavy hitting question started, like, are you going to be the scapegoat? Do you feel like this is your fault? Uh, are you thinking potentially you're not going to be here next year? And he handled it with grace and uh, his experience and the way in which he just rolled it off and said, you know, I've been <laughs> thinking about my job for 40 years, but I, I still keep coaching. So <laughs> he believe. listen, they, Look, the tough part is, is they don't really appear to, like, I think the question maybe if I would have asked it, if I knew, I got to find out if they would have answered it, I would have asked, have the players besides Quandre Diggs complained? You know, I think maybe today, uh, I'll give you a little hint, I may ask that in the teleconference, I may say, okay, there were reports earlier that Quandre maybe voiced some complaints, have any players come and said that this scheme potentially isn't fitting the needs that they have? And uh, we'll see how they how they answer it because it's tough because the defense doesn't seem to be player friendly. I mean, they talk about complementary stuff like the rush and the uh, pass defense and how it's got to work together, but it can't work together uh, in theory because of this. If you give the quarterback uh, four seconds, right, and and you don't get enough to pressure him, there's no corner in the world that's going to let. You know that that, that the, the the receivers have such an edge on offense that it's a it's a pass heavy league now that it's almost impossible for the secondary to cover that long. So I think the issue is probably going to be the pass rush, and that's what they're going to try to do and improve upon is you know complementing the pass rush with a little bit more pressure. And I think with Austin Bryant next year, with maybe a free agent addition, and uh, the the likelihood that they draft heavy in that area you might see a little bit more of that because that's the compliment that's not happening is that in the defense, the quarterback just is, it has way too much time and they know it too. So it's uh, it's well, a, they need a pass rush, but they also need a better scheme yeah. because if they think that they're just going to, unless they get like the absolute best lineup of like the best front four, you are going to need to blitz more to get pressure. It, it just makes more sense. Yeah, it does. It makes a lot more sense that uh, that's. But see, here's the thing: is that 
that's what they're saying because he's been asked that. Matt Patricia has been asked, can you adapt? And he says, I can play any scheme in the world. And so what that what he's telling people is that week to week, they create a scheme. Now, it looks the same most weeks because uh, obviously that, you know, they're not pressuring the quarterback and the quarterback torches you. But remember, they're in games. They're within one possession, similar to the Chargers game earlier in the year. They're within a possession. So there is an argument to be made that, okay, we're close. We're right there. We're just in that process mode of making the plays. We got young talent, and they got to make that key play late. And uh, they're banking on, with a little bit more talent, that, yeah, th- th- this defense, you're not going to see the Ravens, dr- uh, you know, uh, style offense or game where you're going to win 45 nothing. You're not going to see that. Uh, what you're going to see is tight games, control, and making plays late. That's the scenario, but it's a big risk and a big reward. And right now, this season in 2019, it's been a big epic failure. But I could see a scenario where next year, a lot of those close games maybe fall the lines way. You also got to remember, this year also sets up into next year in that you're going to play a dog shit schedule in that you're going to play the likes of Arizona, Washington, or the likes of the garbage teams because you're going to finish well uh, well behind in the division. So it yeah, shakes up. It, it shakes up. The teams that we can't beat, yeah. Arizona and Washington, that we're 0-1-1 against this year. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Jason, you can make definitely arguments, but I'm making the arguments on the side of, you know what, I could see their thinking. I know they're planning. They're, I do believe that they're, they have some kind of – they have an operation and things like that. You're not hearing – whispers that maybe Stafford is going to come back. I think they're going to shut him down, and they're going to maybe play him if it happens uh, the last game, but I doubt it. I think they understand the value of losing and the value of trying your absolute best to win. So that's what I see, and it has been a a terrible season. But, man, I I cannot imagine – I was telling Andrea how fast this year went by. We're already 12 weeks in and, you know, one month left, and we're already going to start our draft coverage my first season covering the Lions has flown by. I just haven't seen a lot of wins. Dude, did somebody, like, body swap you at Tim 20, man? Because <laughs> you seem to be shilling. Oh, okay. You're on the side of, like, this is over. You think that, you know what, are you ready then? Uh, because I've asked the questions. Are you ready to pull the plug on both Bob Quinn and... Matt Patricia, start all over and just find a coach that will take this talent and do whatever with it. Because the idea is if you, you know, remove Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia, you're starting from really zero. Basically, you got a quarterback and you got a couple pieces on defense and then you, you, you don't got much else if you start all over. So are you willing to do that? Are you saying, you know what, I'm over it. I think that Bob Quinn will make picks that won't help this team. I don't see it. Uh, you've lost all faith. You ready to rip the cord? I was ready two weeks ago, but oh. that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that this is going to happen. That's just what I want. Those are my pipe dreams. Oh, yeah. this is it's for, not yeah. going to happen. All right. It's not going to happen. Good. I'm glad that you read our articles and you understand that, that, what the logic is. But set the scene. I don't need to read SI to know <laughs> that the Lions are dumb. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so set the scene. You were there uh, in a house of Lion fans. Everyone taking advantage of the cheap tickets. Let's go to Washington. Hour flight away. Only 10 hour drive. Let's go down to FedEx Field and maybe get a W. And the Lions played like crap. And uh, yeah, the Lions were so poor that they gave me the stomach flu and I had to leave the game early. Oh, no. What happened? Set the scene. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, we make our 10 hour drive and it was great. It was fine. It was, you know, I had a great time with my, my brother, and my nephew, and my dad. And so we get there Saturday. Sunday morning, something's not sitting right. You know, the whole drive, you're, you're eating at the service plazas. So I had like Taco Bell, Burger King, and Chick-fil-A all in one day. And I'm not eating that much fast food anymore. And I don't think something sat well. So Sunday morning, stomach's not feeling too good. Kind of eat super light for breakfast. And we, we finally, we make it to the field. And, you know, my stomach just, it's not sitting right. We're sitting in the sh- we're sitting in the uh, the the shadow area of the field, so it's and it's cold. It was like at least like probably 35, 40 degrees, and it was windy up there. And I'm just sitting there watching the lions just not do good, and I'm trying to get as horizontal as possible in my seat as I can. And probably about halfway through, close to halftime, I'm just like 
I got to go. They're not doing good, and uh, I'm not feeling good. So I walked back, and I got an Uber to the hotel. Oh, so you only made it a half. I'm sorry, man. So did it ruin the kind of experience for you? No, because, I mean, the the experience for me was more than the Lions game. It was more just spending time with uh, with my with my brother, with my dad, with my nephew. It was my nephew's first, like, out-of-state Lions experience. And it's more it, – the Lions aren't going to ruin my day. They're not going to ruin that experience. So while I did miss out on, uh, you know, getting dinner afterwards because uh, I was laying in my bed and, you know, evacuating my system of everything that was in there for the last 24 hours, you know, I still had a great time with them. And Washington, D.C. Is a, is a good town. Awesome, man. Yeah, I'm sorry you got the stomach situation. I think most of the fans in Detroit got that after <laughs> watching that, yeah. seeing Dwayne Haskins on that late drive, man. You just, I mean, you're. did you get that vibe early on? Like, oh, my God, the Lions aren't playing that good. Here we go again. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just another Lions game, and the the score, the, the final score didn't represent what it probably should have been. If Dwayne Haskins, if he doesn't, overthrow the his receivers like it's another 21 points on the board and you know probably it would have been an even emptier stadium towards the end of the game uh well at least you had an experience you got to see a lot of lions fans and that's what i laughed at in terms of the experience was that uh, a lot of lions fans went on the road to witness their team do their thing and unfortunately oh, yeah, there was a there's a ton of people at the hotel too and it wasn't like Detroit or Michigan fans like there was one couple that they came in from Delaware like then the dude had like a had like a lie like a, a Rory lion earring it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen and then there was like a dad and a son that we we met and we thought we were talking with and we're like oh where are you from and uh, he's like oh we're from uh from Pennsylvania I'm like oh cool he's like yeah we're going to see the Lions game I'm like oh who's your favorite team he's like the Lions Wait, you're from you're from Pennsylvania. You could be rooting for the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Philadelphia Eagles, and you root for the Lions. And he's like, yeah, my my favorite player is Golden Tate. Like, oh my god! <laughs> oh god, uh, cornbread. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> All it right, was, it was so bizarre. All right, last four weeks. You know, Vito wrote an article about it. What should the goals be for the last four weeks? I mean, he put. Uh, rest Stafford, play the young players, and um, let's see, what was his third one? Um, his third one was, I think, uh, I forget, but one of them involved Stafford, and then the other one was about the young players. What do you think the biggest goal should be this last month? What do we? What should I dig into? What What are we watching for last month of the season? I mean, they need to throw everything out the window and just, they need to, I want to see them blitz. I want to see them get after the quarterback. I don't care if they get torched every now and then. I want to see the guys who are actually able to put pressure on the quarterback. If, if Matt Patricia can supposedly run any scheme, then I want to see those crazy schemes where like guys are stunting and just confusing the hell out of quarterbacks. And you, you, you're paying Darius Slay all this money to go out and be the best shutdown corner. You know, and he clearly isn't doing his job either. You know, he, he may say that, oh, I'm still the, a great you know, quarterback. From what I've seen, the dude's been getting torched the last couple of weeks. Let them make their own plays and get after the quarterback and let's see what happens. Because I want to know if Austin Bryant and, and, you know, is Deshaun Hand healthy? Is he going to come back this year? You know, let's see what he can do. Uh, Let's see what the linebackers can put pressure on the quarterback. That, that's what I want to see. And they need to just absolutely shut Stafford down. Any, any thought of him coming back is a joke. Yeah, absolutely. That's the one thing. And uh, his third goal was uh, just uh, pump the ball to Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay to, eat, to feed them stats so that they can get some career milestones. So that's where we're at. Oh, no, uh, Why? <laughs> it just, that just that feeds into the, oh, we're not that bad. The fact that they're like leading the league in touchdowns, that's not, it's just, it's Megatron all over again that, oh, he's got all these stats, but we're not good. Yeah, understood. All right. 
uh, one month ago, and then we can focus our attention on who's next. Who's the lucky soul that's going to be drafted by the Lions? Is it going to be Chase Young? Where will they shake out? I think currently they sit at sixth, and uh, there's opportunities for the Detroit Lions to, uh, you know, really probably evaluate. It's probably it. You want my way, you want my way too early prediction of who the Lions are going to take? Go ahead. And this is a little bit, you know, coming from spite, but it's they're going to draft Joey Harrington 2.0 and Justin Herbert. Oh, God. Oh, my God. If they take the quarterback. Oh, my God. I, I could do that, too. Making the pros and cons of drafting a quarterback in the first round. Jason, have I done that? I, I don't even know. So, uh, Jason, I'm at 300 articles in the time. Yeah. 300 articles I pumped out. and uh, You have enough. You can probably you can probably do a pros and cons for all the different types of uh, positions. Yeah. And you can probably even split it up into pros of you know a quarterback and cons of a quarterback. All the way down to pros and cons Ooh. of a long snapper. Ooh, thank you, Jason. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I know. Uh, I just created. Uh, let's see. How many positions is that? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Twenty-two. Exactly. Pros and cons you know, of every of a 44. defensive. Exactly. I love it. I'm, hey, content's king, and I got to pump it out. So let's see what happens. Let's see people really get into it. They do love the goals. They love the. Uh, they definitely love the uh, gym. Uh, okay, I'll ask you this before we talk uh, about Michigan State real fast because look, we'll give them a, a couple minutes, but not too much time on this podcast. Uh, I got a lot of reaction regarding my dear Jim Caldwell. I'm sorry. It was number one for a while, and a lot of people read it. Uh, and then second was the Martha, uh, the Martha Ford, Jeff Bezos potentially selling. Those were the two biggest articles I've written this year. In regards to those people that are looking back going, damn, we had Jim Caldwell, and he was at least getting us to 9-7, and seven. Uh, it kind of harkens to the comparison of Jim Harbaugh in that uh, Jim Harbaugh can't get over the, the big game, can't do the big thing. Oh, I'm going to put a tweet out, too. I think it might light the world on fire. I'm going to tag you in it just to get you all the notifications. Probably shut him off. But at the end of the day, Jim Harbaugh is Jim Caldwell. And Jim Caldwell would get you some wins, handle business, and then take care of things. But at the end of the day, never really got the big win. So what do you make of those now who go, well, at least we were winning some games. At least with Jim Caldwell, he was decent. What do you make of the Jim Caldwell apologists? I mean, I don't, I am not of that, you know, ilk. I don't, <laughs> I don't, Jim, Jim Caldwell wasn't the answer. And for, in college football, it's a little bit different because there are powers. There are power schools. There's Alabama, Ohio State, uh, Clemson, those guys, all those guys. Those guys are going to win the college football playoff. And you can you can reach for more attainable goals in college football and be okay and realize that you know the bigger schools are just going to get the bigger players. But the NFL is supposed to be there's supposed to be parity. There's supposed to be you know the, you're all professionals and there's one goal for the NFL and that is to win the Super Bowl and going out there winning nine ten games. You know, between eight and ten games every year, that's that's not that's not enough. And I'm not going to I'm not going to kill the Lions for their signing of Matt Patricia because that was at the time progressive. That was, you know what, this is the guy who's going to get us over the hump. And clearly, not the answer. And I wish that they had the foresight or they had the general manager who or whoever was in place that could go. You know what? This isn't working either. We need to go to the next guy who's going to put us in the right position. And that's why I would still have hope for this Lions team if they would continue to try to find that guy. And it's 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 frustrating. Understood. All right. Uh, I just want to give love to the sponsor of the Motor City Sports Rant. Uh, the Motor City Palm Brokers are the one-stop pawn shop. When you're looking for quality, brand name, new, and pre-owned merchandise, they got four great locations all across Metro Detroit in Roseville, Warren, Detroit. Definitely go check out Mark and the crew at the Motor City Pawn Brokers. Go in there. Let them know the Detroit Sports Podcast Network sent you. Uh, if you're in the area, Roseville, Warren, Ferndale, Detroit, they'll take care of you. They're trying to change the stigma that pawn shops are the seedy place. They got uh, great quality. Uh, the stores are clean. Great customer service. Uh, definitely Mark and the crew train their staff 
to really help out and really make the experience quality. So today, go visit MotorCityPawnBrokers.com. That's MotorCityPawnBrokers.com to find out about all the deals and the happenings of a great sponsor of the network, the Motor City Pawn Brokers. All right, with our remaining maybe three to four minutes, Spartans, obviously, since we last spoke, you know, disastrous, and uh, they're six and six, and... It's, uh, you know, all season Bowl long. Bowl eligible, baby. Bowl eligible. It uh, moved the needle all about uh, two seconds. I, I kind of was kind of in the camp of, like, just maybe lose to Maryland, and I was like, well, just end it. I saw some of the photos of, of uh, obviously, it's the holidays, but the fans just did not show out at all versus Maryland. There were so many empty seats. Six and six. It's kind of, it feels like to me, if I cover it, it would be one of the first games I cover Michigan State football, but it would be at the Quick Lane Bowl. And that's how far they have fallen. And it feels like it's just a massive disappointment wherever, whatever bowl game they play in. It just seems like uh, for the Spartans, a lost season. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's not really much more you can say. It is the lost season. You know, there was a lot of hope on defense, and there, it just never panned out, or there was too many injuries. And the offense absolutely didn't progress this season. I didn't see. I saw zero progress from last year. You know, whatever changes they made, you know, whether changing around the offensive coordinator and changing to the different positions, there was there was no difference. It looked exactly the same. It was an inept offense. And if you're not going to score points, you're not going to win games. You're not going to win, you know, every seven to sixteen battle, seventeen to sixteen battle. I mean, you're going to get. When it comes up to the to the big teams, you're going to get blown out. So it, it's, again, the same with Lions. Frustrating to watch. And all we can really hope for is that, you know, the end is coming soon. And maybe we'll actually start to rebuild and you know, get back to some sort of, you know, the glory that we had, you know, within the last 10 years. What do you, Is it the biggest mistake, his stubbornness with that offense and just his willing – his unwillingness to adapt. Absolutely. I mean, he he's he's stuck with Brian Lewerke, and Brian Lewerke has been trash these the past what two seasons now. You know, last season, oh, he was injured, and what's the what's the excuse this year? Is that I mean, is the excuse going to be that you know, oh, too many people were injured, or that you know, the with the transfer portal, too many people left, and they couldn't get any consistency. Or is the the problem that they they run an offense that players literally don't want to stay, you know, on this team that they they actually leave in the middle of the season? So it's that's that's got that's got to be the issue. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's about talent. It's about the quarterback play. It's about the coaches that you surround yourself with. And at the end of the day, it's just not good enough. And uh, Mark's taking the program a step backwards, and it sucks. It's been a real bad. Real bad season, and one in which you could almost say it's rock bottom. I mean, I, I would say rock bottom would have been like a a three win season or, or less, you know, because they go they get to this bowl game. It's like a I don't know, it's a it's an empty kind of feeling that oh, there's they still made it to the bowl game, but you know how many other teams made it to a bowl game because they just got the they they scraped out the six wins. So it's uh, it's it it sucks. Always enjoy podcasting. This show, so much fun, Jason. Thank you so much for the time. I wish you a great Tuesday, a great week. Hopefully you and the family had a great Thanksgiving. We'll definitely reconnect soon and catch up and recap everything in the world of Detroit sports, maybe peek at the Red Wings, maybe all the hubbaloo regarding Mike Babcock and every every former Red Wing hates his guts and uh, lots of interesting stuff. Maybe some Pistons, uh, some Pistons talk will make its way here on the Motor City Sports Rant as well. Thank you so much, Jason. I look forward to the talk. No problem. Later. Okay, nice idiot. Uh huh. You. Bye bye.
right. Take care now. Bye-bye then. Loser. <laughs>